Hello, everyone. Hope you can all hear me. Welcome to the Alaska World Affairs Council. Virtual Coffee Chat Part 2 has a hunker down, got you down. Our part one was such a success that we are thrilled to be back with this all-star studded female group to talk about what COVID-19 looks like in their part of the world, as well as what brings them joy and what are they looking forward to. This is super exciting. This type of program wasn't even possible before. Just the thought of bringing back so many people who have either lived in Alaska or traveled all the way from their part of the world to Alaska at the same time in one group is unbelievable. I'm super excited. Um, I'll go over a couple logistics. If I could ask everyone to write down on a piece of paper where you are right now, we're gonna do a group photo after our first speaker. So if you have a piece of paper and can just write down where you're at, um, you can put pictures if you'd like. And this is gonna be a whole lot of fun. The Alaska World Affairs Council, for those of you who are not familiar with us, we are one of 94 councils around the United States. And this program is part of C by C Amplified, which is a World Affairs Council of America's national initiative, where this week, councils from around the world are joining in together to bring discussions that are important to all of us. And the World Affairs Council of America is so glad that everyone is joining from around the world. And if you're from a fellow council from outside of Alaska, welcome. And please support your local councils of the World Affairs Councils of America. So a little more logistics that we have here. We have everybody on mute, but please feel free to keep your video on. We love to see your faces. If you put it on speaker view, you'll be able to see our speakers talk a little bit easier. Uh, we also have a chat feature at the bottom. For my screen, it's in the bottom of the middle of the screen. And if everyone could just tap in there, your name, where you're from, let us know who you are. We're super excited to see people from all over the world joining in here. We're going to have a conversation going on during this conversation and through the chat function. So keep a track of that. Also feel free to ask a question at any time to each other, to our speakers. Tell us what you're doing right now, hunkering down, what you're looking forward to. And we'll keep a, a, another conversation going on right there. So. Um, looks like people are joining us as we speak. I haven't seen yet our first speaker coming up. Um, so I'll just wait a couple more minutes here. Our production technician is Siobhan Choi. If you have any technical questions throughout this, this conference call or this coffee chat, just go onto um, your chat function and send something to the administrator and she'll help you out with that. We're gonna try to keep everyone um, our conversation short and to an hour and get everyone out after an hour. We're hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end. If not, like I said, post them in the chat room and we'll try to answer them there. So with that, um, do I see Tarhu? I do not. So I'm going to go ahead and jump to Catherine Barnes. And Catherine is a former Alaska World Affairs Council board member. She is also a moderator for a program we had on women in STEM. It was a fabulous program. She lived in Alaska, hails from England, and she's back in England. So we haven't seen her for a couple of years. It's so excited to see you. And um, she was our Twitter extraordinaire, helped us a lot with social media. And we missed that. We hope you can continue typing things about this program and others away from England, but we want you to talk today about what's going on in England. So we hear that England is now number one in Europe. You have more than 32,000 deaths in England. What's going on? Hi, hi everyone, can you, can you hear me? Yeah? Um, hi, it's so, it's so nice to see everyone again in Alaska and from around the world. Thank you so much for um, for inviting me to take part today. Um, it's really nice like, to see some of my friends dialing in. So it's, it's lovely and uh, I really enjoyed the last one of these with uh, hearing the different perspectives from around the world. Um, so yeah, so I'm in, uh, I'm in London. I'm actually on um, maternity leave right now. So it's all, it's all been a bit, a bit crazy. Um, I had a little boy in October um, and he's seven months today. Um, so yeah, as Lisa said, we've had a, we've had a crazy few months and, um, 
you know, the, the, the news is kind of, um, you know, not great reading, particularly this week. Um, I've seen a lot of the coverage from around the world looking, looking at what we're doing. Um, and yeah, it's certainly weird. I, I do science policy and communications for a living. So it's been a bit bizarre watching it all unfold from my, from my living room and um, now kind of full-time mum of two running a kind of preschool for my four-year-old and, and watching the baby at the same time. Um, and yeah, as Lisa said, we, we have been hit particularly hard here in the UK and we were in, gosh, I can't even remember, what are we now, week seven, eight of lockdown. Um, but we're hoping maybe on Sunday there may be some restrictions ease. We'll have to see. But, you know, unless, you know, uh, you know, unless there's a vaccine or herd immunity anytime soon. And I think everyone's kind of, you know, it's more or less lockdown for, for the way forward, I think. Um, it's, it's just, yeah, it's all bizarre because when I, I, I left work in October and we were in the midst of planning for a no deal Brexit. And I was involved in some of the contingency planning for the, for the science sector. Um, and of course, everyone at the time, you know, we kept saying, you know, this is the biggest crisis to hit the civil service, you know, in peacetime and, you know, once in a generation defining, uh, you know, issue. And, and now, I mean, it, you know, Brexit has been completely blown out of the water by this. I mean, it's, it's just unprecedented. Um, it's, it's weird as well, because it's sort of, you know, such a thing that three and a half years or so of sort of defining issue we had that really you know divided the nation and and was very kind of bitter bitter debate we had about it for three years and now it doesn't even you know doesn't even register in the national consciousness um you know doesn't even get any coverage you know it's like it's like not even an issue anymore so it's kind of strange that it's taken something like this to pull us together but in a way it has um so i mean certainly I mean, what brings me joy is things like, um, you know, people's newfound appreciation for, for the NHS. And I mean, people have always, you know, loved the NHS here. Um, but I think it's slightly in different way that people have a newfound respect for some of the workers that maybe weren't as well respected before, some of the lower paid, you know, frontline workers that people now appreciate, gosh, you know, they're on the front line, they're keeping us safe while we're staying home. So, I mean, that's really nice to see. Um, and my, my brother's a nurse, a community nurse as well. So, and one of my best friends is, is working in intensive care up at um, University College Hospital, um, where, I, where I did my degree. So it's something, you know, it's pretty, pretty personal, as I'm sure it is to, to, to many people. Um, so something that we do here every Thursday night, in fact, it's going to be starting in a couple hours at eight o'clock here is our weekly clap for our carers. And I think I've seen this around the world. I think um, it started in some of the other European countries. I know my, my cousin in Geneva said that they were all doing it in their flats. I don't know if it's nightly there or weekly, but here we do weekly. And I mean, it is so lovely because we're all, you know, in our homes and we're allowed, at the moment, we're allowed out just once a day, really. And people come out on the streets at eight o'clock at night and they're clapping and, you know, some people play musical instruments and you wave at your neighbors and you see how they are. And my daughter now, I mean, she, she says every Thursday, oh, is it clapping tonight? And she stays up late um, so she can see the little girls over the road and wave at them. There's two little South African girls that live in, in the house opposite. So she waves at them. And what they've all done is um, everyone's been painting rainbows. I don't know if this is like a UK thing or an international symbol now, but um, everyone is doing rainbows and putting them in the window. You can't see but my, my rainbows in the window behind me. And so we've been sending, you know, because we have so much time now in preschool every day, we, we've been drawing rainbows and sending them to my parents and to family and they put them up in their windows. And so if you go for a walk all down the street, you can just see all these rainbows everywhere, which is really nice. So it's a symbol of hope and, you know, people thinking about, you know, thanking the frontline workers, you know, for looking after us and keeping us safe. Um, so, and that's something that really brightens your day if you're, if you're out and about, um, you know, we try to go for a walk, you know, or a jog or something once a day. Um, and so the other thing as well that I've noticed that, again, is, is funny for London is, um, we're much friendlier now than we used to be. Um, and London <laughs> London is normally like, you know, those of you who've lived in London, or I'm sure other big cities like New York, I remember I lived in New York as well, is we don't normally talk to each other. We're, you know, we're so busy, we're on our commute, we kind of head down, you know, we're cracking on with our day, we're busy. It's not like smaller towns like Anchorage where, you know, everyone chats and, you know, everyone's friendly. Um, so, you know, that's we're out, we're talking to neighbors, you know, people stop by, because obviously you can't really, you know, 
socialize but can people can kind of stop by and say hello and see how they are people are checking in on neighbors if they want you know if they need anything and yeah that's not normal for london at all and in fact i read a piece a few weeks ago saying that um london's become more northern now so in the uk you know up north is is known to be more friendly than down south so so that's something i sent that to my friend that lives up north and you know so we had a smile about that um, and I would say for me, keeping me calm as well as my, my Labrador, Juno. Um, so that's good for, for stress relief after a uh, long day with the two little ones. Um, yeah, my chocolate Labrador. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping she's going to go back into doggy daycare soon because she, she's pretty bored, you know, long days here. Um, so things I'm looking forward to again, I mean, they're going to announce um, on Sunday, I mean, they've been getting lots of coverage already about, you know, what are they going to do? Are they going to ease restrictions? So hopefully maybe next week you might be able to socialize more kind of in a socially distanced way in the park. I don't know what that means for little children. I, I don't think they can really socially distance. I mean, I think it's impossible, but maybe hopefully soon my daughter, she, you know, she just turned four on Sunday, she might be able to have a play date in the park or something. Um, we're pretty sure that COVID went through her nursery like February, March time because loads of people got sick, the staff were sick, lots of families have been sick. Um, we were actually, away, weirdly, we were away in Oman. It was like the one holiday we were like, right, okay, you know, Henry, the little boy, he's now, well, he was about five months. So we're just kind of over the worst of the newborn phase and we we're getting ready for our big, you know, lots of travel time and all the rest of it. So we, we actually had one week in Oman because my, my husband was working there. So that was, was lovely. Came back watching the news from Italy while we were there thinking, oh gosh, what are we going back to? And then the week we came back, it was like, that's it. You know, everything was closed. We were locked down. Um, but um, we were away that week and I think some of my I, you know friends colleagues everyone was still working in London that week in middle of March and I think that's when a lot of people got quite sick um, and I had a, a friend one of um, the mums from the nursery she owns a medical clinic and was able to get some of the antibody tests and they all tested positive mum dad and the little boy and the little boy didn't have any symptoms so I think lots of the children have had it and potentially not had symptoms so maybe that's a pathway for for you know potentially socializing a bit more if you know that some people have had it or at least you know a few families together i don't know let's see what they say um obviously you know longer term it would be lovely to see you know parents family again um here in the uk and colorado my husband's from colorado we've, we're supposed to be in denver right now actually um but you know let's let's see what happens and it may not be soon um Certainly, I kind of more on a professional level, I'm watching as well to see what's happening with the vaccine. I know we've set up the vaccine task force now. Um, so it'd be really interesting to see. I was watching an interview with the, um, the director of the Wellcome Trust the other day, um, and he was saying, you know, the global collaboration so far has been absolutely staggering. So that's something, you know, that's really heartening, really positive to hear that there's so much coordination going on right now um, and it's unprecedented. Um, so perhaps that's something hopeful um, that, you know, maybe, you know, the scientists are pulling all the stops out and maybe we may get a vaccine sooner rather than later. Uh, but yeah, let's let's see what happens. Um, so I, I think that's it from me. I'm happy to um, take any questions on chat and um, I'll hand back to Lisa. Wonderful. OK, so I'm going to put you back on mute. And that's fascinating. I'm thrilled you named your dog Juno after our <laughs> great capital in the state of Alaska. It shows our connection and, and what an impact you might have had on you because you definitely had a huge impact on us, Catherine, and I hope you do come back to the United States. And thanks for sharing that in the UK. A lot I did not know, and I didn't know what those rainbows represented. So um, okay. interesting. Yeah. Um, we are next going to go to... Uh, someone who, against the odds, is a female Pakistani journalist, a journalist in Pakistan, and she was in Alaska a couple years ago as part of a State Department program, and we were fortunate to feature her in a coffee chat. And Tarhub, I am a big fan of yours. I am on Facebook and watching you do your posting about COVID-19 in Pakistan, and some of it I can read and some of it I can't read, um, but I can't wait to hear directly from you what is going on in Pakistan. Share that with us and what brings you joy, what you're looking forward to. Tarhub. Well, uh, hello to everybody and hope everybody is doing well and everybody's staying home to be safe and I hope everybody's safe. 
and uh, well, um, less, uh, you talked about you didn't understand few of my articles because it's it's in Urdu. That's why you were unable to read it because it's for you know Pakistani audience as well. Well, um, in Pakistan, I think I just I, I'll just start off with the current situation that right now we have approximately twenty five thousand Corona active cases, in confirmed cases in Pakistan, and there are a lot more active cases. And the death rate is 2.5 percent. That is approximately uh, 550 deaths so far. And uh, a good news is recoveries, and that is you know I guess the exact number is official exact number is 6,464. That makes 26 percent. So well, um, we have something very different different from other world we had for the first case was reported in Pakistan I guess back in mid March and it was um, it was um, yeah it was reported in mid March and so far after you know two months we have like approximately 25,000 cases and uh, we have um, and and the worst thing is that we don't um, the people who are getting infected in Pakistan, they don't show much symptoms. Approximately 90% of people are not showing any symptoms who are Corona positive. So that is, you know, something very dangerous for everybody because you don't know if the next person is infected or not. So you have to be very, very careful. And second thing is more and more males are getting infected rather than females. Maybe, you know, um, because uh, males are getting more interaction from outside their home and uh, the age and the, the the age limit is young people in Pakistan are mostly get affected and they're aged between from 20 years to 40 years so they are getting more affected in Pakistan and uh, well um, I remember Pakistan they imposed their uh, they imposed impartial lockdown on 21st of March and today our Prime Minister Imran Khan he announced that we're going to ease lockdown though the graph is getting high the deaths are getting high but being a developing country we cannot afford to linger on this lockdown because we have a lot of people who are suffering in um, he was constantly telling this thing in his speeches that you know we fear that more people will die with hunger rather than from coronavirus. So we cannot afford this. So we have to be very, very careful. We have to maintain social distancing. It will be done by collective responsibility. Um, our society, our people have to be very responsible along with the government. But you know, when the lockdown will be eased, then definitely more responsibility will be on the nation, not on the government. So um, special SOPs, has been developed for uh, you know for our people that how you're gonna deal when the lockdown will be open and uh, from Saturday onwards they're going to open it in phases so um, before that we have you know they have already opened up some businesses like construction businesses and a few more businesses because a lot of people were suffering and um, not even this small businesses are you know they're they're suffering a lot a lot of businesses have already been shut down and uh, you know this is going on but still the the the, me, the best thing that i have experienced you asked about what um, you know brings joy for us the best thing is that you know uh, ramazan is going on everybody's fasting in pakistan and uh, whenever i go for my work i i just see one thing that is you know a lot of people are doing a lot of charity you know they're getting they're getting food bags food packages they're giving up monies to people who can't afford to buy food or who cannot have anything to you know uh, be in a good shape in this uh, pandemic period so a lot of people are doing a lot of charity to help others and um, one thing that um, I personally did and what I experienced people around me are doing is that they're getting more foodie so everybody, you know, they're staying at home. They don't have anything to do. So they are cooking and they are eating. These two things that I think is bringing joy to a lot of people. And uh, the other thing is that, you know, th this is a positive sign. And I guess this is a very good thing that um, a lot of people are doing plantation. So uh, even the government has initiated a program uh, through which they're giving, you know, 1,200, um, 12,000 rupees to every uh, needy person and instead of that 12,000 uh, rupees they have to plant um, trees for the government so basically uh, they have you know they are they are actually trying to 
um, giving indirectly giving jobs to people while helping them. The government has initiated this project. So they're giving money to them and asking them to plant trees so that, you know, we can also cope up with the climate change uh, thing as well. So these are the most positive things that I have seen so far. And not only, the, not only this, what I have observed is that, you know, um, right now we don't have uh, such severity like in Europe and in America that is going on. So um, yes, people are, you know, they're reluctant about this thing going on. They're not much, uh, take, they're not taking it so, so very, very seriously because they haven't seen, you know, a lot of people are not showing symptoms. Uh, so far, our health system is not yet crashed, and I hope it won't. So that's why, you know, uh, we haven't seen worse so far. So that's why I think that is the reason that people are also, you know, reluctant in um, getting, though they are getting depressed while staying at home, of course, when your uh, daily routine gets disturbed, you, you know, you don't uh, feel good staying at home, your daily activities get stopped. So that, that is the main reason that they are being depressed. Or maybe, yes, there are a lot of people who are losing their loved ones and they're, they're, they're definitely, they're sad about it, they're depressed about it. But uh, we have not reached towards our worst. So that's why um, um, people are not much worried about this thing. But yes, um, our government has to face a lot of challenges to reach out to people and telling them that this is something very important. But um, along with that, uh, we are sometimes we are unable to understand the strategy that what is the actual strategy that they want to adopt because um, at the same time, they're telling them that, you know, this is very serious and you have to take it very seriously. But at the same time, they're telling them, don't panic. So, you know, uh, when you're when you're telling them that don't panic, just it will be fine. You will be it, it will be, you know, um, everything is normal. And at the same time, you're telling them, you know, it is serious. So they're putting everything, every responsibility uh, towards people like you have to be responsible. I think they're, they're trying to make people realize that you have to be responsible because, yes, they, the government have a lot of uh, they have uh, a lot of time. They have told very directly that uh, we don't have much uh, finances. We don't have much. Uh, things because you know the developing countries are having their best health system crisis, and you know uh, they're 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 unable to deal with it so effectively. So this is something that that is around us. So we are a developing country. We are not financially that strong. So we have to be careful by being by making ourselves responsible. So this is the actual strategy that uh, the government has told their people and that they want people to understand. But I think so far people are um, not taking it so seriously because we haven't seen worse. And I hope we don't see that. And I pray that, you know, things will get better. But so far we have seen an exponential growth in our, um, you know, graph and uh, cases are increasing debts are increasing but and i am worried about it you know lockdown is they they have eased the lockdown already so what's going to happen next so in a couple of few coming days or maybe a week or so um there is a chance that we can we we will see a um, few more not few more maybe maybe unfortunately, maybe more cases in Pakistan. So this is the current situation right now. So, well, we are eating and enjoying and staying at home and trying to stay safe and planting. And, you know, this is the best thing that we can do so far to stay at home and do this. But, yeah, well, I have to go to do my work, but I have to be also, I have to be very careful. So everybody's scared, but still, I guess we can fight together. So... We have to be united to be you. We have to be united to fight against this virus. So this is so far Pakistan is doing right now. Okay, Tahub, I'm going to put you on mute. But um, if you wouldn't mind, in our chat fun function at the bottom, type in what brings you joy and what you're looking forward to. Um, we just want to try to keep to the time schedule. And uh, thank you very much for sharing what's going on in Pakistan and translating all that I've been reading on Facebook. So a huge plug for anyone who's on Facebook follow Tarhub. She has some great stories. Uh, right now we're going to do our photo opportunity. So if everyone will pick up their paper and show us where you are calling in from, we're going to take a picture 
And you will see this on our Facebook, our emails. And it's fun if we can see your face, Fran. There you are. Oh, we can't see you and the picture. <laughs> Okay, super. Thank you everyone for participating in that group photo shoot. Now I'm going to move on to our next speaker, Dr. Joyce Azam, who also against all odds, uh, she is the first Arab woman to summit all seven summits and congratulations on your doctorate degree, Dr. Joyce Azam. She also was part of the first all-female team to summit Everest. And we are a fan here at the World Affairs Council. Uh, she has a blog about her explorations and asked her to come all the way from Lebanon to Alaska last year. And she didn't hesitate and said, absolutely, I will take that trek. I have climbed much higher mountains than the flight from Lebanon to Alaska. And she did, and she won all of our hearts. And she joined us for our last video chat, part one. Thank you very much. But now is our opportunity for us to hear from you, uh, Dr. Joyce, what is going on in your part of the world? Hello, everyone from the Lebanese mountains. And thank you, Lisa, again, for having me. Um, actually, it was my second visit last September to Alaska because I climbed Denali. I had to climb Denali as the highest in North America. So I'm always happy to come back to Alaska. I have a lot of great memories and great people I met there. Um, just to um, like, um, it's a not like a, a thing you said, I'm the first uh, Arab woman to climb the seven summits. I am the third actually. And that's amazing because we have many Arab women <laughs> that climbed the seven summits and well and hopefully we'll have more and more because uh, we have a, a group of women climbing the seven summits now and uh, they are in the middle of this challenge so I am here in the Lebanese mountains um, you know as a mountaineer uh, I decided to move to the mountains and it's not the first time I live here actually I lived here for um, my training. So now I'm sitting at 2,000 meters in feet, it's around 6,000 feet, and I can climb up to 10,000 feet and uh, get myself, you know, a good training up to Ernitis Soda or the Black Horn, which is the highest summit in Lebanon. Um, I am here because I stayed for 20 days in Beirut and I was really feeling down. I don't know if anyone relates to this, but sitting at home was really hard for me. And um, I try to keep up with my routine, daily routine. I try to be, you know, like positive, but I decided at the end, before, you know, the big lockdown uh, around the 25th of March, I moved to the mountains and I'm here. Uh, so it, like what brings me joy here is nature, mount <laughs> the mountains the cedar forest. Uh, so I, I'm, I actually, I live five minutes away from the historic uh, cedar forest of Lebanon. You know, the cedars are our national uh, tree. And uh, like, I, I, you know, there's 6,000 years trees, cedar trees here, 3,000 uh, years cedar tree. I go and hug them. This what would give me a lot of energy during the day. Um, and I am keeping up with my daily routine on a personal level. But if we want to talk on, you know, like on a national level as Lebanon, um, luckily we, di we didn't get hit by the coronavirus with huge numbers, like cases, I mean. Uh, we, we only have 784 cases, thank God, uh, 25 deaths and 20 uh, 220 recovered, um, but like yesterday, we got 35 cases in one day. For sure, they are travel related also, but still, we, I mean, we are very proud of our new minister because this government was, you know, like uh, elected newly and the, the Ministry of uh, Public Health, uh, you know, they are doing great job on keeping up with this um, situation of coronavirus, uh, especially that Lebanon went through a lot since the 17th of October, 
2019, uh, the revolution, uh, which um, like it's it's not like the, the revolution uh, uh, caused the disastrous economy situation that we are living through it now, but it was uh, like uh, the moment where people couldn't handle it anymore and they went on the streets. So today, Lebanon, uh, like many cities in Lebanon, are living the hunger, not because of the lockdown and the businesses are affected, but because of you know the the disastrous economic situation caused by uh, years and years of corruption, uh, like 30 years after the Lebanese civil war that ended in 1990. And uh, since then, we didn't have a real strategy, a real plan to, you know, like um, create the growth of the country. So um, today, it's, it's a really hard situation. Protesters are returning uh, to the streets. Um, they are taking care of you know like uh, uh like they they are keeping distance and and uh, putting the masks and sanitizing but still people are suffering from hunger and are just going to the streets and this is really alarming for us because we really don't know what to do because we didn't really um uh, like control the situation of uh coronavirus but the other situation may you know um be impacting uh, the situation of coronavirus to get even worse and uh, then there's also the syrian refugees in lebanon and um you know like living in tents would be really uh, <laughs> disastrous also if you get just one um case in the, in the syrian refugees but thank god no cases there but also uh, they lost their jobs because all the syrian refugees would work at, you know like in labor or they are workers so they also lost their job and they are suffering also from this coronavirus outbreak so um this is more or less uh, you know uh, in, in a macro uh, level situation like in lebanon um our lebanese uh pound is really going you know like in a free fall um it it lost its uh value five times so um for example if uh 1500 lebanese lira or pound uh was equal to one dollar today is around five thousand so it's it's a really disastrous and and more than five thousand. So just make the math yourself. And we are on a shortage of dollars, so we cannot really get our dollars. Like we, because in Lebanon we use the U.S. dollars and the Lebanese pound. So you can have at the bank an account in both cu currency. You know wherever you choose. So whoever has the account in US dollars, they cannot access their money. And there's shortage, uh, shortage on um, US uh, dollars. So this is, is really forcing the Lebanese authorities to work on a new financial instruments, but still we don't have a solution in uh, the horizon. So we are living the uh, uncertainty on all levels. <laughs> and uh, this is why, even though I'm in nature, I have my moments of, you know, down moments, but uh, I keep it up and, um, you know, fight my anxiety um, by um, going for a hike. So I'm really blessed to, to be in, uh, you know, in like just in the mountains outside, there's not even a shop or anything. I'm like out, like I'm in nowhere. Uh, so this is really this is really helping me to keep it up and prepare also for my next challenge, which is the Explorers Grand Slam. Um, I want to go to the South Pole, North Pole, and traverse, you know, like the 1,300 kilometers. Uh, and with that, I hopefully would be the first Arab here, <laughs> Lisa, maybe, uh, to to accomplish this. Uh, uh, I mean, this big achievement, the Explorers Grand Slam, and the third female uh, in the world in the long distance. 
Uh, so the Explorers Grand Slam, it's uh, about climbing the seven summits, which I did, which is the highest in each continent. This is really the hard part uh, in it. And then go to the South Pole and the North Pole. And I had to be in Nepal now. Like I, I, I had to start with this, my, my uh, talk, but I forgot. Like, it's, like uh, this is why I fell down because I had a plan to go to Nepal. I'm working with uh, uh, Lakta Futi Sherpa, a Nepali um, woman Sherpa. And uh, together we created uh, an initiative called Everest Voices. And it's about cleaning up the mountain and protecting uh, this fragile environment uh, on Everest. Uh, because when I climbed Everest at 8,000 meters, uh, which is the highest camp on Earth, um, it's camp for the South Pole, uh, and uh, we call it the death zone, uh, I slept on trash. So also this uh, project that I was preparing for it for six months, uh, also is, uh, uh, with uh, partners in uh, Vancouver, uh, Mountain Plastic and Himalayan Life, where we, you know, together we are even taking the plastic from uh, Mount Everest and then recycling the, the plastic and making use of it. So there was a, you know, huge project. We wanted to launch it this uh, March, April, and I wanted to stay on Everest as an active, you know, activism act and, and just um you know speak up from up there to protect our mother earth and treat it as a mother uh, and respect so um i couldn't but i'm doing it here in the lebanese mountains i'm cleaning up the mountains while i'm hiking on my own i'm doing you know uh, maybe it's a very small 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 part but at least we can start somewhere and i'm planting cedar tree because there's a very like baby cedar tree that I can, you know, take them and, and plant them in uh, different parts of uh, the mountain. So yeah, this is uh, what I'm doing uh, and, you know, what's happening in Lebanon and what's happening with my own life. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Joyce. And, and I hope that you, you do your, your goal of the um, Summit Grand Slam uh, soon. So who was the first person who, who accomplished that? Who first female to accomplish the, the Everest Grand Slam? Uh, she's Norwegian. And um, I, um, I cannot remember the name because it's a Norwegian name, but, you know, I can, I can just Google it now and write it down in the, the messages. But there is just one female from... Uh, like Norwe Norwegian and one British woman. So if yeah. I can accomplish uh, this in the long distance, because it's like uh, 1,300 kilometers, you will have to spend two months in the South Pole, traversing from coast to pole, not just the last degree, like it's equal to 100 kilometers. And this is the really hardest part to go to every continent, climb the highest mountain, climb Everest, and then go to the two poles. So it's really complicated and takes a lot of time and a lot of determination. And hopefully I will find the sponsors to, you know, to fund this uh, two last uh, expeditions. And especially the North Pole, I really hope with this uh, situation of the COVID-19 that you know, made all the earth relax a little bit. And hopefully that uh, the um, ocean up there will, not, will, will get like, because, okay, so today uh, the, the South Pole is a continent, right? So it will not melt. Um, but in the North Pole, it's an ocean. So if it melts, you would just be skiing on water and you would, you know, have a lot of, it's risky. It's, it's uh, really risky. And since 2010, no explorer could do it, do the last, uh, like the long distance in the North Pole because of the climate change, because, uh, you know, all like uh, the globe is, um, is warmer and the ocean up there would melt faster. So you don't have the time of two months to traverse the whole distance. So 
we had to do just at the since 2010 all the explorers did the last degree which is 100 kilometers so i hope in 2020 with all this awareness we are getting um, by living through the COVID-19 in the whole world, which is, it's hard, but it's also good. There is really a goodness in the pain we are living through, uh, where we are aware of uh, our, you know, the connection that we have with, uh, with our nature. And hopefully I will be able to do the long distance in 2020, uh, 2022 for the North Pole. So this is also on the, a positive note, let's say. We are definitely going to follow you on your journey with the Explorers Grand Slam. Thank you so much, Dr. Joyce. So great to see you. And now I'm going to move to a wonderful lady, uh, Miss Archana Mishra, who is from India. And a plug for her book, if you are on Amazon, The Fortunate Child by Archana is a wonderful book. And she came to Alaska and we had the pleasure of uh, having her part of the Alaska World Affairs Council Board of Directors before she was whisked off to Australia, where she's working on her PhD, but she got whisked again and is now in Qatar. So, and I understand you're doing work with refugees who are in India, you still have connections and ties to everywhere, including Alaska. Thank you so much for being part of this program. I really am pinching myself that I can see you and I can <laughs> see all of these people that are so important to us here in Alaska yeah. at the same time. So Archana, tell us what is going on in India and in Qatar where you're currently sitting. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. And wow, I'm just impressed by two of your speakers already. Um, and I'll try to do some justice uh, to this forum. Um, so first of all, good morning to Alaska and good afternoon and evening to those signing in from other places. So happy to be able to do this coffee chat today. It's uh, more than 8 p.m. in my part of the world and my bedtime is 8 o'clock. So you know, forgive me if I doze off in the meantime. Uh, and uh, as you have just mentioned, I have recently moved to Qatar from Australia, which is where, uh, where we are, which is our home, but my roots are still in India. And I've been so lucky that that's why I've been keeping in touch with all my people. And uh, also my heart home is Anchorage still. So there you go. I belong to many places and I have many homes. <laughs> um, so what, I had something else um, in my mind to speak uh, today, but this afternoon something grip me and I, I wanted to pour my heart down on a piece of paper. So I penned something and I'll go through it um, just to express how I'm feeling about these two places and uh, my hopes, desires and everything is included. So um, I'll start with just saying that we are all in the same storm and we are feeling the waves and we are all frightened. But not all of us are in the same boat. Some of us are in sturdy, stable and big ones while others are in old, fragile, and damaged ones. As COVID-19 continues to rock us, the boats are getting shakier, and the people in it are now having mixed feelings. The lockdown is getting longer, and the self-quarantine life is getting a bit old. Some have lost family members. Others have lost their jobs. Some have fallen sick and recovered while some are afraid that they'll die of hunger before the virus even gets them. Some are enjoying more family time with loved ones, while others feel stuck at home with their abusive parents or partners. Some are taking this time to cook and share recipes with friends, while others are eagerly awaiting their once a day charity meal just to stay alive. In Qatar and in India, the number of infections are rising and lockdowns are imposed to control the spread. So most people are working from home and children are learning from home, which is a struggle for them. Qatar has reported almost 19,000 cases and 12 deaths as of today, while India has reported around 53,000 cases and almost 18,000 deaths as of today. Sorry, 1,800 deaths as of today. And Qatar's number may not seem that high compared to other places, but keep in mind that the population is merely 2.5 million and to have 19,000 cases is pretty high. Given this situation, many of us have confined ourselves to homes and practicing social distancing when we are going outside. But 
The migrant workers who are far from home and are stuck in both countries do not know how they're going to cope. In India, the workers walk hundreds of miles to reach home, only to be held in quarantine camps or not being allowed to enter their villages for the fear of infection. In Qatar, the workers live in small quarters and cannot afford to practice social distancing. So the infection is rising among them. They are away from home without their families, but going home is neither possible nor the better alternative. The daily wages in India do not know how they'll survive the lockdown any longer, even when they fully understand the reasons for why the lockdown is imposed on them. The migrant workers in Qatar are uncertain of what will happen to them if they get infected, or worse, if they lose their job and have to go back to their home country penniless. While some are enjoying cleaner air in India due to the lockdown, others are despairing as they have nothing to eat while breathing that clean air. While some are finding inner peace as they now have time to reflect and begin their inward journey, others are tormented by being locked up inside a confined space. It's especially hard for people who seek inner peace in their place of worship. So seeing people celebrate their festivals quietly inside their homes and without visiting their church or temple or mosque or the synagogue must give us a sense of solidarity that's unspoken and yet profound. Many of us are cautious in maintaining the social distance without creating the emotional one. Many of us are reaching out to the vulnerable and less fortunate of us because somehow this pandemic has made us feel their pain more. Living in Qatar where 90% of us are expats, this sense of connection is quite palpable. We are looking out for each other as we know what it must feel like to be far away from home, regardless of how much wealth and material we may have accumulated compared to them. In our residential compound, people are now more willing to help those who work here. Earlier, we may have seen them as just the service providers, our cleaners, our gardeners, our janitors. But this crisis has made us look at them just like one of us and feel their pain that deeply. We ask them about their home, their families, and their own feelings as they carry on their work day after day, not knowing what's coming for them. In India, many people have taken upon themselves to feed and provide for the stranded migrant workers or those that have lost their jobs. Actually, many of my friends around the world sent me money for the fundraisers that we did for those workers. And I was amazed by the generosity with which they came to my door, knocked at the door and gave me money. Some sent me money from across the world. That was the true connection I felt in my heart. Some have dedicated themselves to looking after the stray and abandoned people in both countries. People also continue to pay wages to all the service providers, even though they are unable to come to work. Employers are now more understanding of what working from home is like. People are now reconsidering what the essential and non-essential things in life are. We are now reflecting more as we question our deeply held views and our behavior about the environment, money, family, work, friends, or societies in general. So in between the dilemmas of economy or environment, physical or mental health, social or cultural well-being, and material or spiritual richness, a lot is being lost and learned. But what if we started looking at these dilemmas as not either or, but both and? What if we wanted economy and environment, physical and mental health, social and cultural well-being, material and spiritual richness? What if we led our society not chasing the GDP growth alone, but our overall well-being? And why not? A new normal is dawning upon us. What exactly it would look like is not yet clear. But the core of the society worldwide is shifting. Whether this shift will be temporary or longer, is not yet clear, but some of us will lead the shift for sure. So what if we led for well-being? What if we made decisions not just because it would bring more money, but also considered how that could affect the environment or health or relationships? 
I'm sure this crisis has already made us more aware of how we make decisions. So why not act now? Why not change now? I know that this storm will be over and that we'll make it through. I just hope that when we make it through, we look at those in the damaged, old and fragile boats and support them in building a more stable, strong and resilient one for themselves. Thank you. That's all I had. Thank you, Archana. Um, wow, I'm, I'm blown away by, by what you wrote. I hope you publish that. Uh, we have it recorded and I wanna play that over and over to a lot of people. And I see some chat comments you. about your references to a boat. It really is a visual, yeah. powerful reference. It brings it all together. So please do um, continue this conversation, the chat feature sure. about what brings you joy. I wanna talk with you so much more, but I'm also trying to be yeah. cognizant for time. So sure. um, please do join us in the chat feature and thank you. And I'm going to move over to Miss the Honorable Fran Ulmer, who you'll see her full bio on our website, but it will also tell you that she's the Senior Fellow in Residence at the Harvard Kennedy School, as well as the Chair of the Arctic Commission. And she's also the Advisor Director of the Alaska World Affairs Council Board, which we are so thrilled, to, thrilled and proud to have you part of our organization. You're a frequent speaker, moderator, companion of the King of Norway when he came to Alaska. And um, we want to hear from you today about what does the Arctic look like right now? I know there is no one Arctic, uh, but if you were to talk about the Arctic, give us a little perspective on what COVID-19 means. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this amazing panel. And uh, I love the statement that we just heard. And I, I just wanna say, sitting here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, I feel like the Alaska World Affairs Council is truly global. Oh my goodness, uh, we have been all over the world this morning, which is great. Uh, I, I'll just say briefly, Cambridge is a place where, uh, as you might imagine, things have been really kind of stressful because, of course, Massachusetts is in the category of states that have high COVID numbers. And unfortunately, we have been in lockdown for the last eight weeks. Uh, uh, we will be until May 18th, mandatory face masks on the street, etc. But lots of teddy bears in the windows. I noticed that that's happening in Alaska too. So uh, there is that sense of hope and there is a lot of compliance. You go for walks and you always see people with masks on. People wave at each other to try to bridge that chasm between us and them. And uh, you know, the, the good news is I think we're making progress. So when you look at the Arctic, doing kind of an overview, the countries of the Arctic have all been hit very differently and have responded very differently. And we don't have a lot of time left, but I'll just use two examples. Iceland and Sweden are kind of at opposite ends of the pole. So uh, Iceland was in a six week lockdown, but they have now reopened. They had extensive testing and tracking uh, quarantine efforts and of course a small population helps but they have been very successful at regulating and maintaining low numbers. Sweden has taken a very different approach. Sweden's approach was sort of the herd immunity approach so it basically asked everybody to just use common sense and uh, don't be part of a crowd above 50 50. Uh, in comparison to a lot of others, that seems sort of like no limit at all. Schools are open, bars are open, restaurants are open. So how, how is that going so far? Uh, different reports, but if you compare the death rates, just as an example, uh, the death rate in Sweden, 18% uh, of diagnosed people, how does that compare to its neighbors? 3% in Norway, 4% in Finland, 5% in Denmark. So if you just look at that particular indicator, maybe not so good, but only time will tell. I want to say that in two weeks, there will be an overview on the Arctic hosted by the U.S. Arctic Research Commission, the U.S. Naval War College, and the Wilson Center. So we're going to take two afternoons, uh, May 19th and 20th, and basically look at the impacts of COVID-19 on Arctic countries. 
community health, economic impact, scientific research, uh, international responses, and how they differ. And you can sign up for that free of charge at the Wilson Center website. So you get a much deeper dive into that question. But I would just say in the last couple of minutes that I have left, what gives me hope, what gives me optimism about the future is that I sense that there is a real revaluing of science, the importance of investing in science, the importance of using science in smart ways, not just for public policy, for technology, for healthcare, for a whole host of things. And for a while, it sort of seemed like maybe we had lost touch with how important that kind of work is, research and engaging people in the scientific efforts. I think we've also seen much more awareness of the fact that we are one world. You can't build walls around countries because there's no way of keeping viruses, there's no way of keeping pandemics in one country. So I am looking forward to, in terms of personal joy, coming back to Alaska June 1st, being able to go for walks when I can see the mountains, when I can actually breathe the beautiful fresh air of Alaska. I'm looking forward to that a lot. And thanks again for hosting this wonderful session. It's been wonderful to see the chat box and see the faces of friends from all over. Thanks again. Can't hear you. There you go. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Fran, and thank you so much for your perspective. We are also watching very closely what's happening in Sweden and uh, wondering if that is herd immunity is the way to go. Alaska, if you probably know, just opened up for business. We're in phase one. We're starting phase two next week, actually on Friday for the state. Uh, Anchorage probably next week. And it is all seems like an experiment, but science is the key. So thank you for that, that information perspective. And thank you everyone for joining us today. This is part of C by C Amplified, a World Affairs Council of America global initiative to increase awareness and global competency. We are all part of the network and, and I encourage you to join in for more programs that our 94 councils are having all week. There is more information at cbycamplified.com and please support your local World Affairs Council. The World Affairs Council is so thrilled that so many people joined us today and so many of our past speakers came back to be part of this program. We love you, we miss you, and we are glad that you're all safe and we hope to see your faces in the mountains or anywhere that you happen to be. So please tune in and join our email. We are having more programs coming up. So please join us and follow us on Facebook and have a wonderful rest of your day. And goodbye from the Alaska World Affairs Council. Bye.